TJ Parcel is the director of a brand new movie that is coming to the Reeling International Film Festival here in Chicago. It's called Invisible Gay Women in Southern Music, which I think is a topic that many people didn't even think about. How did you discover uh, all these songwriters, TJ? Well, I had moved to Nashville uh, because of my husband's work. And I was here literally just a couple of days when a, a, a new friend called me up and he said, TJ, I got this idea for a film. Do you want to have coffee? And this was a guy who was in the stained glass business. And I thought, OK, everybody's got an idea for a film. What do you got? Um, and he said, gay women and country music. There's this entire network of gay women songwriters who've written for everyone. And many of them are my friends. And I had a little RCA dog moment. I just tilted my head and I thought, huh. That's fascinating. And it was literally three weeks from that coffee to when I sat down with Mary Gaucher to do the first interview. And now, is, uh, yeah, okay. no, I, I, I just was uh, blown away by uh, Mary and Mary's story and her willingness to open up. And the rest of the women in the film kind of just they, they fell in line. It, it took off like a rocket ship. Mary goes, or I think it was Bonnie Baker said, oh, Mary Gaucher did it. I'll do it. Jess Leary says, oh, Mary and Bonnie did it. I'll do it. And Kennedy Rose came on and it just continued. So this was a film that picked me. It wasn't one that I necessarily picked. Now, were you a fan of, of country music? Were you connected to a lot of the songs that they had written without knowing the backstory? Uh, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not a. I'm not a big country music fan necessarily. Um, but I've been on the earth for a while, and uh, you know, I mean, I grew up listening to Barbara Mandrell and uh, you know uh, many of the artists, especially those songs that were crossover, like Sleeping Single in a Double Bed, um, and uh, uh, so yeah, I, I was kind of uh, blown away by the catalog of songs that have been written by uh, lesbians. And there was part of me that thought, geez, I sure would love to be a fly on the wall when some of these good old boys get to see how much of their beloved country music was written by lesbians. Some of the artists that all these women wrote for, Johnny Cash, Garth Brooks, Reba McIntyre, Tim McGraw, Linda Ronstadt. I mean, there's iconic names with iconic songs. What did you learn, especially making this film, about that struggle, especially for, for the songwriters? Well, you know, I spent years in, in software before I ruined my life to become a filmmaker. And, uh, uh, you know, when I was in the software business, it was a very competitive world. And it was the 1980s, the 1990s, and uh, being out was not acceptable. And I was in sales, so my job was to build relationships with people. And so talking with them about my boyfriend wasn't going to build a lot of bridges. Um, so for me, it was a business decision. I was just... I compartmentalized my life and I played the pronoun game and, and I knew what that cost me. Um, and so I think coming from that experience, I was very curious to have this, these conversations with these women because they're in an industry uh, that I can't imagine a more repressive industry than country music. And uh, so, that, I mean, I think that's, that's the approach that I, I took here. And, you know, I think that, um, it was fascinating to me the way each woman had chose to deal with the industry and what it costs them. Or in some cases, you know, I mean, Kai Fleming uh, is an artist, a songwriter who's in the Songwriting Hall of Fame. She's written so many number one hits. She doesn't know how many hits she's written. Um, uh, for Kai, the stakes were immediately high because she had immediate success when she she came to Nashville. So she chose to put her sexuality on the shelf. Um, other artists in our film, like Mary Gaucher or Diane Davidson, you know, they're, they're very self-effacing about it. They're saying, look, there's no closet big enough for this. So they didn't have that choice. And I thought it was very interesting to just, you know, talk with them and look at what their journeys were like. And the thing that I hope um, most people will come away from the film with is that in spite of all of these institutional forces that seem to almost conspire to keep them down, their music and their art came through anyhow. And uh, I find that very, very inspiring. If they were to be able to live their lives truthfully, especially in the early 70s and be who they were 100%, would we have these songs that made them famous? You know, because I think they poured all their emotions into their writing and into their song creations, would those songs have come to life if things were different? 
They may not have. I mean, one of the, the central uh, characters in, in the film uh, is Diane Davidson. Diane Davidson is an artist who came to Nashville when she was 16. By the time she was 21, she had four albums. Um, she toured with uh, Linda Ronstadt. The Moody, she opened for the Moody Blues. She had this uh, incredible promise and this very strong, powerful voice. And yet her fourth album had a lesbian love song on it, and that killed her career. They shut her down. And I, I, you know, I think I, for me, when I was filming this and I went to hear her perform, um, I, I mean, even, you know, at, at the late stage in her life, she's got this incredibly powerful voice and I was deeply moved by it. And I think I got really angry that um, for a very stupid reason, we've been deprived of this talent. And I wonder how many other voices out there like Diane Davidson's but we've been deprived of because of these folks who are in key decision-making uh, positions decide for everybody else what we, we should and should not listen to. Oh, exactly. I mean, she does have a wonderful moment there in the, in the film with, with Linda Ronstadt. And I believe this is the last time that we actually get to hear Linda on video sing. Is this correct? It is, yeah. I, we went out to uh, visit uh, Linda Ronstadt. I guess Diane had not seen Linda in many, many years and she brought her guitar because Linda Ronstadt has Parkinson's. She can't sing anymore, but she loves to have her uh, musician friends who can come and, and perform for her. So Diane brought her guitar and they reminisced about uh, uh, life on the road back in the day. And they started talking about a song that that uh, Diane used to sing and, and Linda would do backup on. And uh, uh, as a big surprise to all of us, Linda started singing. And I could tell you that there was not a dry eye in her house that day. We were, yeah, our sound guy was holding the boom pole and he had tears coming down his face and the cameramen, their, their viewfinders were, were steaming up. It was, it was a very powerful moment. I think that magic comes through in the film because you can hear people gasp in the audience. And then oftentimes when it screens, there's a, a spontaneous round of applause at the end of it. So, you know, I hope people will come out and, and see the film. It's a great film. It's very inspiring. It's very uplifting in the end. Um, and uh, it's got just terrific music from start to finish. Uh, TJ, thank you so much for your time. Reelingfilmfestival.org is where you can go ahead and buy tickets. The festival starts opening night is on the 23rd and Invisible Gay Women in Southern Music, Wednesday, September 29th at Landmark.